at you early. Probably nobody's gonna come, but we'll see. We'll just wait a minute and see what happens. Well, good morning. Good morning, Kim. Oh, my mom. I just see my wife. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, mom. Happy Sabbath, Cindy. Happy Sabbath, Marvin. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Sabbath morning. And here we are together as a family. About to do Bible study. And so I say we... Nancy Sky is here. Nancy Sky appreciates the earliness of the message. <laughs> As she lives in the future. <laughs> Nancy Sky's been real helpful with the YouTube page. She's been doing a really good job maintaining it. So, let's see. We talked about what last time? We talked Can't about say the Bible. We talked about the Bible. We did talk about the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what did we talk? Oh, we talked about the Bible. What did that say? Oh, uh, we studied it. <laughs> Me and my wife, we got jokes. We got corny jokes. Anyways, we're going to talk about the true message of Laodicea today. So I say we get started. Okay. Would you pray with me? Yeah. Thank you. Everybody knows my pretty wife. Extra pretty this morning. Here we go. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another uh, blessed Sabbath day. We thank you for an opportunity to read the Bible and to get together with a group of our, our family. And um, so we thank you for the great privileges that you give us. Heavenly Father, as we move forward in the Bible study, we ask that you would uh, forgive us of any sin, that you would cleanse and purge us from unrighteousness, and that you would help us to walk very carefully before you this holy Sabbath day. Lord, we ask that you would clear a path before us for this Bible study that you would give us a double, triple, quadruple portion of your spirit, all of us, not just um, for uh, leading in the Bible study, but for hearing and seeing the things which your word has to say. So we ask for protection from your angels, audio, video. We ask that you would just be with us in ways that we cannot think or imagine. So Heavenly Father, as we get ready to start the Bible study, we want to thank you for the privilege of Jesus, the forgiveness of sin, and the Holy Spirit, which is the guide of all truth. Heavenly Father, please let this prayer be acceptable in thy sight, for we ask it in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay, so we got a Bible study. And the Bible study we're going to be talking about is the book of Revelation, chapter 3, 15 to 22. It's kind of a part of the three angels' message when you break it down and begin to see the different facets of it. But we want to just take a second and talk about the book of Revelation as a whole. The book of Revelation as a whole is designed in a very specific way. So let's go to Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 and see if we can get a little hint of the book of Revelation as a total. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So here we see a message that goes out to the seven churches, right? This message to the seven churches has a very specific meaning. This message comes from him who is, who was and who is to come. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, just for a few seconds, about the book of Revelation and the numbers seven. Right? If you look at the book of Revelation, you're going to see a lot of sevens. You're going to see seven churches, seven letters, seven spirits of God. Does the Bible actually say that God has seven spirits? Or does the Bible say that he has one spirit? Why does the Bible say that he has seven spirits in the book of Revelation? You see seven golden lampstands, you see seven stars, you see seven seals, you see seven eyes, you see seven horns, you see seven angels, you see seven thunders, you see seven trumpets. It's very important 
to understand that these sevens, right, the, the, the trumpets, the seals, the churches, the angels, the eyes, the horns, each one of these is different topics. For example, the seven churches are literally God's people. The seven seals have to do with the gospel. And the seven trumpets has to do with God's people in apostasy and the punishment they receive for being in apostasy. Very important that each one of these groups of sevens is simply just different topics. And they're interconnected in a very specific way. How the first church, the first seal, the first trumpet all describe a specific era in time. The second church, the second seal, the second trumpet all describe a, a specific era in time. And you'll notice that they are connected by the different um, colors, the different aspects that each one carries. And it, you know that this is about time because at each seven, the seventh church, the seventh trumpet, the seventh seal, this is when Christ comes at each seven. Very important to understand that each seven Christ returns. And a lot of people will say, well, Christ comes back 15 different times. That's not the case. God is describing what's happening in the seals, which represents the gospel throughout these seven different time periods. And as God is revealing to us what is happening through these seven different time periods, the culmination of every single topic is Jesus Christ coming to redeem his own. And this always falls in the seventh time frame. Very important. We'll study this another time, but I just wanted to give that backdrop so that we aren't, don't feel like we're jumping around. So that when I say Laodicea is the last church, we have an understanding why Laodicea is the last church. Because we're talking about the seventh church. We're talking about the seventh seal. We're talking about the seventh trumpet. We're talking about earth's final time period. You can actually prove this, not just from the book of Revelation and the position of Jesus in each one of these um, topics, but if you go to Exodus 24 to 32, it's a typological example of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and that there are seven chapters. Each chapter has a different position of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. The final chapter is about the Sabbath. The final church is about the Sabbath. This is a, a type, beautiful typological example that we see. We're just going to now proceed from this moment and understand that the seven churches are seven time periods, and each time period Christ has a specific message. Very important. It helps you understand the book of Revelation very, very clearly. And once you understand how it's broken into seven time periods, at least from Revelation chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 12, this is uh, uh, the, the time periods broken down into seven different facets, and it covers several different topics. All right, so we're going to talk about the churches for a moment. We see seven churches. We see the church of Ephesus. We see the church of Smyrna. We see the uh, church of Pergamos. We see the church of Thyathera, we see the church of Sardis, we see the church of Philadelphia, and the last church is the church of Laodicea. Now, when you examine these, you notice that Jesus is in a specific position in these churches. For example, the church of Ephesus, Christ says, remain to what you have, or I will take your light away, I will take your candle away. And where does he take it to? He takes it and gives it to somebody else. He takes that light and gives it to the church of Smyrna. And from this moment on, we don't see a transfer of light. We don't see Christ's position, right? In Ephesus, we saw Christ is, is, is here, and then he takes the light and gives it to somebody else. In Smyrna, there's no mention of a candle, no mention of Christ. In Pergamos, there's no mention of a candle, no mention of Christ. In Thyathera, that middle church, that church that represents the 1,260 years. We see Christ is then again present. And this is what he says. He says, hold fast till I come. This is one of the times of great tribulation, the 1,260 years, when the little horn power, the man of sin, the beast of the sea, 
ruled and reigned for 1,260 years. Christ said, be patient, I'm coming soon. The next church to come is Sardis. There's no mention of Christ in a time frame. Then comes Philadelphia. And to Philadelphia, there's a specific message given. And Christ says, behold, I come quickly. And then the next church after that is Laodicea. And Christ has a very specific message for Laodicea. We're going to get into that in a moment. But this is what, how Christ describes himself in position with the church. Talking to the church of Laodicea, Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Very important to understand that as you're going through these church time frames, that Christ is in a specific uh, position in each one. And as we go down the, the, the chain of time, Christ is saying, I'm getting closer, I'm getting closer, I'm coming quickly, I'm finally here. So to understand Christ's position with the church is to understand the specific time frame in which we live. And when somebody's at the door, when somebody's at the door knocking, that specifically means that they have arrived. And so Laodicea is the seventh church. It's the final church that is to be on the earth before Christ comes. And it has it has a specific uh, meaning of the name. Let's check this out right now. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. We'll read the whole message at first, and then we'll begin to break down this very specific message that Christ has given to the last generation of Christianity. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. Revelation chapter 3, 14 to 22. Here we go. Revelation uh, chapter 3, 14 to 22. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and what, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness does not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame also and am sat down with my father in his throne. He that have an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay, so here we see a message to Laodicea, Earth's final Christian group. And it's a very strong rebuke. And it has a very specific message. And the first thing we want to look at is Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and the angel of the church. Now, an angel always represents a heavenly messenger, right? So we can read it like this, and unto the heavenly message of the church of Laodicea, right? Very important that this is a heavenly message to the church of Laodicea. The word Laodicea has a very specific meaning. And this word Laodicea means people of judgment. That's what Laodicea means. It means people of judgment. So as we read Revelation 13, 14, we can read it like this. And unto the heavenly message of the church of the people of judgment, these things saith the amen, the faithful, the true witness. So this is a message to the final church era. This is a message to the people that are on the earth right before the second coming. And obviously we ask a lot of questions in this Bible study. So we want to ask ourselves, 
right? When it says, unto the angel of the church of the people of judgment, unto the heavenly message of the church of the people of judgment, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Who is this amen? Who is this true and faithful witness? We want to ask ourselves that. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 20. Here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says this. For all the promises of God in him, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God. Who is him? Him is Jesus. So all of the promises of God in him are yes and amen. So who is the I, who is the amen? Jesus is the amen, right? And it also goes to say in Revelation 3, 14, that he is the true witness. What does that mean? John 14, 6. John 14, 6. Here we go. John 14, 6 says this. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So who is this amen? Who is this true witness? This is Jesus talking. Jesus is talking here, and it goes on to say that he is the beginning of creation. What does that mean? John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So here we see a message, a heavenly message to the people of judgment. And this message comes directly from the Amen, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. That's Jesus. We are given a message, a heavenly message that comes directly to the people of judgment from Jesus. The very important to understand that the message we are about to get into, this comes directly from Jesus himself, right? So Jesus is the one who is the creator. He's the one at the beginning of uh, creation. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the amen. This message comes directly from Jesus. So Revelation chapter 3 verse 14 literally says there is a message to the final church on earth, Laodicea, and the people of judgment. And this message comes directly from Jesus. So let's hear what this true witness has to say now. Let's see what Jesus has to say to the end time church. Revelation chapter 3, 15 and 16. Revelation chapter 3, 15 and 16. Revelation chapter 3, 15 and 16 says this, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Very important, very important. Let's read that again. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. What does this mean? What does this mean? Let's investigate cold. What does cold mean? Proverbs 25, 25. Proverbs 25. 525. We're looking at cold. Proverbs 2525. Proverbs 2525. As cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Oh, let's not let this pass us by. Proverbs 2525. As cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. 
What does the cold water represent? The cold water represents the good news. The good news is the gospel. Very important to understand that Jesus is referring to the gospel when he's speaking of cold water. Matthew 10, 42. Matthew 10, 42. Matthew 10, 42 says this, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, truly I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. We're talking about sharing the gospel here. Very important to understand that the cold water represents the refreshing we receive when we accept the gospel. The gospel is refreshing. Very important to understand that this cold water represents the gospel. What does this hot mean? Very important. What does this hot mean? Exodus 32.10. Exodus 32.10. Exodus chapter 32, verse 10 says this. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. So here, Moses, or God is describing to Moses that his wrath, that his judgment is waxing hot against the children of Israel. Very important to understand that this hot represents God's judgment. Psalm 38, 1. Psalm 38, 1. Psalm 38, 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither discipline me in thy hot displeasure. The hot represents God's wrath. The hot represents God's judgment. Very important to understand that the cold points to the good news of the gospel. The cold points to the good news of the gospel. And the hot points to the judgment of God, right? So question, right? This cold, this gospel, this hot, this judgment. What does this remind me particularly of? This reminds me of something very specific, right? The gospel, the everlasting gospel, the hour of judgment has come. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Revelation 14, 6 and 7 says, And I saw another angel in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. We're talking about the three angels' message here, right? And this is very important to understand that when Jesus in Revelation 3, 15 and 16, he's saying, I wish that you were cold. I wish that you were hot. But because you are lukewarm, I will spill you out of my mouth. Jesus is saying, I wish you preached the gospel. I wish you told the people of the coming judgment, but because you do not, either of these things, you have become lukewarm and I will vomit you out of my mouth. So this lukewarm, it's not hot, it's not cold. This lukewarm represents a compromise. Very important to understand, this lukewarm is a compromise. It's not preaching the gospel. It's not warning of the coming judgments. It's not preaching the three angels message. It's not, clearly. We, saw, we just saw that in the scriptures. So if you look at the Christian world today in its total, if you look at the Christian world today, literally look at the Christian world today, what do you see? Do you see the gospel being preached? Do you see the warning of the coming of judgment? Do you see the three angels message being preached? You do not. This is especially dangerous. And I'm, uh, I'm reaching out to some family now. This is especially dangerous for people who say they preach the three angels message. Especially dangerous. 
for people who say they preach the three angels message. Are you hot? Are you warning the people of the coming of judgment? Are you cold? Are you preaching the everlasting gospel? If you're not doing either of those things, you are lukewarm. If you aren't sharing the good news of the gospel, if you aren't warning the people of the coming judgment, you are lukewarm. And that comes from Jesus himself. That does not come from Mr. Brad. That comes from Jesus himself. Now, we want to ask a question. How does this lukewarm make Jesus feel? How does this existence of lukewarmness make Jesus feel? Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. Revelation uh, three sixteen says, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold, neither hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. I will vomit you. I will puke you up. Very important. Jesus is saying, because you are lukewarm, because you are compromising, and because you are not preaching the gospel, and because you are not warning of the coming of judgment, you are lukewarm, and I will vomit you out, right? So the result of this lukewarm state of Christianity is being vomited out. It's being rejected by Christ, and it literally makes Christ sick to his stomach. It literally makes Christ sick to his stomach when we do not preach the gospel and we do not warn the coming of judgment. It makes Christ sick to his stomach. This compromise, this lack of preaching the three angels' message. Now, this is a very hard saying. This is a very hard word. And I say it carefully, but I say it plainly, right? Because this is going to be one of Earth's hardest warnings to hear. And if we can get through the rebuke, and if we can get through the correction, we will see the love of God for us. And if we get through the rebuke, if we go through the correction, we will see a mighty reward of love given to us, right? So let's check this out. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 to 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 15 to 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 15 to 17. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God. In the sight of God speak we truth. Very important point to understand that those who are doing God's will do not corrupt the word of God. But the thing about Laodicea, Laodicea corrupts the word of God. Very important to understand that those who are preaching the gospel, preaching of the coming of judgment, preaching of the three angels' message. You should not be corrupting the Bible. If you are corrupting the word of God, you are falling into a Laodicea rebuke. Very important. Very important. Acts 20, 26 to 27. Acts chapter 20, 26 and 27. Acts 20, 26, and 27 says this, Therefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Very important to understand that, I, therefore I take, rec take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the counsel of God. What? is the counsel of God. What is the counsel of God? Psalm 32, 8. Psalm 32, 8. There we go. Psalm 32, 8 says this. Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eye. 
So what is the counsel of God? It's the instruction. It's the in teaching of which way God would like to take us. So one definition of the counsel of God is his instruction and his teaching. Psalm 119, verse 24. Psalm 119, verse 24. What is the counsel of God? Psalm 119, verse 24. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Very important. The Bible is the counsel of God. God's teachings, God's instructions are the counsel of God. Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So who else is the counsel? Who else is the counselor? That's Jesus. Jesus is the one that is described in Isaiah 9, 6. So what is the counsel of God? The counsel of God is his teachings, is his instructions. The counsel of God is his word. The counsel of God is Jesus. Very important. Very important to understand that the church of Laodicea rejects the word of God. The counsel of Laodicea, the, the, the church of Laodicea rejects the counsel of God. They reject the word of God. They reject the teachings and instructions of God. Laodicea rejects the word of God the teachings and instruction of God, they reject Jesus because they reject the counsel of God. They, will, they refuse to preach the gospel. They refuse to preach of the coming judgment, right? Galatians chapter one, verses six through eight. Galatians chapter one, verse six through eight. Now we're being thorough here so that there will be no questions when it comes to this Laodicea mind frame. And we're about to see, how do I get out of this? How do I get out of this Laodicea mind frame? Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 8. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you which would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Laodicea does not preach the true gospel. Laodicea preaches a separate gospel, which causes them to be accursed, which causes them to be vomited out. And for us, this is a very serious warning, because what is the gospel that we adhere to? Are we adhering to the prosperity gospel or are we adhering to the everlasting gospel of the three angels message? Very, very, very important. Laodicea is moved from the true gospel to a false gospel. And this is what causes Jesus to vomit this end time church out. This is what causes Jesus to reject this end time church. So what does the mouth mean? Right? What does the mouth mean? Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 says this. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So the mouth represents the word of God. This represents Christ's mouth. This is, this is, the mouth represents God's word. Jesus is going to reject us by his word. Job 30, 10. Job chapter 30, verse 10. Job chapter 30, verse 10. Job chapter 30, verse 10. And they abhor me and flee far from me and spare not to spit in my face. 
very important to understand that this spitting out, this is connected to shame. This, this spitting out is connected to shame. Isaiah 56. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. Hang out. Hang on with me now. Hang on with me because this rebuke has a solution. And once we get through this rebuke, once we accept and incorporate this rebuke into our life, we'll see the love of God and then there will be a mighty reward. Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56 says this, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. What is the, this spewing? What is this spitting out associated with? It's associated with shame. So as Jesus uh, spews us out of his mouth, his word should be correcting us and causing us to have shame in our inappropriate behavior, which is not preaching the gospel, which is not warning of a coming judgment, which is not taking heed to the counsel of God, which is his teachings and his instruction, which is his word and which is Jesus. When we reject these things, this should cause us shame. <clears throat> and we, and I say we because we are the Laodicea end time church. So all of us are incorporated. I am, I need to incorporate this rebuke into my life. So when I say we, I mean simply the whole planet. We, the Laodicea church, we are spit out. We are vomited out. We are puked out because it is a shameful, disgusting church. This is why Christ rebukes it. This is why Christ rejects it because it's a shameful and disgusting church, right? Which has, this Laodicea has stopped preaching the gospel. They have, and they refuse to warn people of the coming judgment. This is why we are disgusting to Christ because we have stopped preaching the gospel and we refuse to warn people of the coming judgment. <clears throat> and this refusal of preaching the everlasting gospel and refusing to warn people of the coming judgment is in itself a rejection of the three angels' message. I'm going to say that again. This refusal to preach the gospel this refusal to warn people of the coming of judgment is a rejection of the three angels' message. And as a result of rejecting this, we are rejected. Revelation 3, 7, Revelation 3, 17. Revelation 3, 17 says this. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The rebuke of Christ continues. He started with, I wish you were cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. I wish you preached the gospel. I wish you warned of the coming judgment, but because you're a compromised church, I reject you. And then he goes on to say this. This is a, a, a double rebuke. And he says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Another sharp rebuke. If we get through this, we will see that there is a solution to fix this Laodicea mind frame. And what we see here in this passage, we see two opposing views. Very important. Hear me out on this one. Please stay with me. We see an opposing view, how we view ourselves and how Christ views us. Let's check this out now. How we view ourselves. Because thou sayest. Christ is saying, this is how you view yourself. Because, now I'm talking to me too. I'm talking, this is how I view myself. Because thou sayest. I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That's how we view ourselves with this pride and arrogancy. Then Christ goes into his view of us and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So we have two opposing views. 
We have the view of ourselves, and then we have the view of how Christ looks at us. Very important. Very important to understand that this is two opposing views. How we view ourselves, which Christ says is not a proper uh, understanding. And then Christ gives us the actual state of what we are in. So how we view ourselves is rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. That's very important to understand. But Christ's view is that he, we, he knows that we're miserable, wretched, poor, blind, and naked. What does it mean to think that I am rich? What does it mean to think that I am rich? 1 Timothy 6.10 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 says this. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Oh, when we go after money, when we covet after money, we err from the faith and we are pierced through with arrows. Arrows represents the word of God. God shot at them with the bow. And when the arrow struck, it hit the heart like the word of God. Very important to understand that we put money before God. Very important. Galatians 6, 3. Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. Galatians chapter 6, verse 3 says this. For if a man think in himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Why do we think we're rich? Because we put money before God. Why do we think we're rich? Because we have spiritual pride, right? For when a man thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. The Laodiceas are deceived into thinking they are something when they are nothing. That's literally what Christ says. Proverbs 26, 12. Proverbs 26, 12. Here we go. Proverbs 26, verse 12. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. My pages on this Bible are starting to get stuck together. Proverbs 26, 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own eyes? Seest thou a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope of a fool than for this man. Why do we think that we are rich? We think we're rich. We think we have money. We think we have uh, wisdom. But all this leads to nothing but spiritual pride. That's why Christ says, you think you're rich and increased with nothing. But that's not the case. We're really miserable, poor blind and naked. Why did Christ call us poor? Why did Christ call us poor? Luke 5, 11. Luke 5, 11. Luke chapter 5, verse 11 says this, And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsake all and followed him. Him is Jesus. And when they brought their ships to land, they forsook everything and followed Jesus. Jesus calls Laodicea poor because we don't forsake all. We hold on to this world and its riches. We hold on to um, thinking we're wise in our own eyes. And we develop spiritual pride, just like the Pharisees of old. This is the same state of existence as the Pharisees of old, putting um, too much trust in this world's money, having too much spiritual pride, and being trusting in your own wisdom. This is why Christ says we're poor, because we have not forsaken all and followed him. We have not forsaken all and followed Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, 7 and 8. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8.
Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. This is what it says now. But that, but what things were gained to me, those I count for loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do not count them, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You see here, Paul is explaining that he has let go of everything for the simple knowledge of Christ. And he considers everything in this world dung. He considers it feces for the knowledge and experience of Christ. Because in Christ is the fullness of all riches. Laodicea has not stopped and given up this world and forsaken all and followed Christ. Laodicea continues to hold on to this world in one hand and tries to hold on to Christ with the other. But they're not following the true gospel. They're not warning the people of the coming of judgment. They have spiritual pride and arrogancy. They have not forsaken all. They have not seen the value of the knowledge of Jesus. Very important. Very, very important. To consider Christ as the highest value above everything. Christ is the highest value above everything. And Laodicea does not have this mind frame. Laodicea, the end time church, the church right before the second coming, does not have the mind frame that Christ is the highest value. Very important. Matthew 6, 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Here we go. Matthew 26, Matthew 6, verse 24. It says this, No man can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and worldly riches. We cannot do it. And the Laodicea mind frame tries to serve God and mammon. When Christ is clear, you cannot serve God. You cannot serve worldly riches. This is spiritual pride. This is spiritual arrogancy, right? Ephesians 1.7. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7 says this, In whom we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. His grace is the riches. His grace, his blood. What the redemption, what Christ did for our redemption. This is true riches. And the church at the end of time rejects this. They don't see the value in it. And because of this, they have developed a spiritual pride and a works-based mind frame in which they feel they don't need Jesus. Very dangerous. Very, very dangerous, right? Laodicea loves rich things. Laodicea loves financial prosperity. And Laodicea loves spiritual prosperity, right? Laodicea loves big, extra extravagant churches. Laodicea loves having prominent positions in the church, right? Laodicea loves everything beautiful. Laodicea loves everything perfect. Very dangerous, very dangerous mindset in Laodicea. James chapter one, verse five. James chapter five, verse one, I'm sorry. James chapter five, verse one. James chapter five, verse one. Go to now, ye rich men, and weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and your silver are cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye shall have heaped treasure together for the last days." Woe unto us who think we are spiritually rich. Woe, 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 woe unto those 
who think they are spiritually rich. Revelation 3.17, it continues. Now, as we go through this, this is a hard saying. When you get through this rebuke, when you look and self-evaluate and say, what is it in this message that I am doing wrong? And when you embrace it, and when you hold on to it, and when you allow the words of Christ to cut you, he's simply cutting you to heal you. And as you are healing, you will then develop into the kind of Christian that wants that Christ wants us to be, which is the 144,000. And there's a special reward for those who go through this rebuke, accept it, are cut by it, and are healed by it. There's a special reward. Revelation 3, 17 says this. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Why would Christ call Laodicea miserable? 1 Corinthians 15, 19. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19 says this. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Here Paul is saying, if we hope in Christ, to this world we are miserable. What's the reverse of that? If in this world we don't have hope in Christ, to Christ we are miserable. So this rebuke of being called miserable from Christ himself is an acknowledgement that our real hope is not in Jesus, but our hope is in the riches and the in the fact that we think we have need of nothing. And when you have everything you need, you don't hope for Christ. And so this being called miserable is a revealing that our hope is actually not in Jesus Christ. Christ calls us miserable because our hope isn't in him. We have a superficial Christianity at the end of time, right? In this Laodicea end time church, it's a superficial Christianity. And we need to have a strong rebuke, right? This rebuke is strong for a reason. Because either this rebuke is going to wake you up or this rebuke is going to cause you to run away. And this is going to separate the goats from the lambs. This is going to separate those who are sincere in Jesus and those who are simply superficial Christians. I say this carefully, but I say it plainly. This rebuke is necessary to separate the superficial Christians from the real ones. And we have the super official Christianity in Laodicea. And we need a strong rebuke that comes from Jesus himself. Because if it didn't come from Jesus himself, we wouldn't believe it. Right? Why did Jesus call Laodicea blind and naked? Why did Jesus call Laodicea blind and naked? Mark 8, 18. Why did Jesus call Laodicea blind and naked? Mark 8.18. This is what it says. It says, Having eyes ye see not, and having ears ye hear not, and do ye not remember? Having eyes ye see not. Jesus is calling Laodicea spiritually blind. Spiritually blind. John 12.40. John chapter 12, verse 40. John chapter 12, verse 40 says, He hath blinded their eyes and hath hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted that I should heal them. This is a very funny scripture. Who blinded the eyes? Who caused them to be deceived? so that it's impossible for Christ to convert and heal. Who did that? Very important. Who blinded them? 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 
2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Who blinded the Laodiceans? Satan. Why? Why were they blinded? Because they did not believe the gospel. That's clearly what the scripture says. They were blinded by Satan because they did not believe the gospel. That's exactly how the rebuke started. I wish you were cold. I wish you taught and believed the gospel. But because we are blinded, which took place by Satan, because we did not believe the gospel. Why are we naked? Why are we naked? Genesis 3, 7. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. And the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. What does this nakedness represent? It represents the shame of sin. It represents the shame of sin. Christ said, you think that you got clothes on, but you don't have clothes on. You are naked. The, same, the shame of your sin is exposed. Ezekiel 16.36. Ezekiel 16.36. Ezekiel 16.36. Thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms, which is apostasy, with thy lovers and with all the idols of the abominations and the blood of thy children, which thou didst give unto them. This nakedness represents sin. This nakedness represents knowing sin. This represents spiritual idolatry. This represents apostasy. This nakedness represents the shame of sin, the shame of knowing sin, and being in apostasy. This rebuke of being blind and naked is a rebuke saying, you don't have spiritual eyesight. You are in apostasy and you cannot even see it. Very, very carefully, we wanna to listen to this as we begin to be teachers, as we begin to be doers of the word of God. Is this rebuke going to shape and mold me into the person Christ wants me to be so that I can be? a proper teacher of the word of God. Very important, very important. Hear me out on this, right? This is a true message to the Laodicea. This is a heavenly message that comes from Jesus himself to the end time church. That is us. This, is, this message is for us, right? The very last group of Christians on the planet will reject the gospel. The very last group of Christians on the planet will reject the gospel and they will reject Jesus as Lord and Savior because when you reject the gospel, that means you reject Jesus as your Lord and Savior. They will reject Jesus as judge. They will reject the three angels message and the three angels message. Hear me out on this. The three angels message is the very thing that prevents people from becoming lukewarm. Because the three angels' message foundation is the everlasting gospel and the hour of judgment has come. And when we refuse, hear me out on this present truth movement. Hear me out on this, those who bear the three angels' message. When you refuse to share the three angels' message, you are refusing to share the gospel and you are refusing to share the hour of judgment has come. Get right with the creator. Very important that this Laodicea mind frame is for not just all of Christianity as a whole. It's specifically for those who bear the three angels message. Right? And so this is what happens. This Laodicea mind frame is rejecting the gospel. It's rejecting the fact that the hour of judgment has come. And on top of the fact that this group has rejected the gospel and has rejected 
the warning of the hour of judgment. This group has spiritual pride and arrogancy. They've rejected the gospel. They've rejected the hour of judgment. And on top of that, they're spiritually prideful and spiritually arrogant. This is what causes Jesus to be disgusted and vomit them out. Because not only did they reject the gospel, not only did they reject the hour of judgment, they rejected the three angels' message. But on top of that, there's a spiritual pride and a spiritual arrogance which causes Jesus to get disgusted and throw up. That's literally what the Bible says. That's a very hard thing to say, and I say it very plainly, that this end-time church disgusts Jesus to the point of throwing up. And that says a lot, right? That says a lot, considering the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, right? That says a lot, considering that Jesus loved us so much that he would rather die on the cross than not have us in heaven, right? Jesus restored us into a right relationship with God the Father. And Jesus gave us victory over sin, death, and the grave. And Jesus allowed us to have this privilege of having a forgiveness of sin, having a right relationship with God, and having victory over death and the grave. And what do we do with all that Jesus has done for us, right? Because Jesus did a whole lot for us. We still think we know better than Jesus. And this is the real shame of the Laodicea church, right? They've rejected the gospel. They've rejected the message of judgment. They have a spiritual pride and arrogancy that causes them to think that they don't need Jesus. And that even though Christ did all that for them, died on the cross, gave us a relationship with the Father, gave us victory over death in the grave, they still reject Jesus and think that they don't have any need for him. And this is what causes Jesus to get sick to his stomach. But hope is not lost. This seems like a very dark place to be in. And the, the, the rebuke is for the whole planet. There isn't, uh, Jesus didn't say, but this little group is separate from this. The rebuke is for the entire um, church era. The, 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 the whole end time church group falls into this category. I do as well. I especially need to look into this because um, how do I stand with the spiritual arrogancy and pride? Do I feel as if I am rich and in need of nothing? Check yourself, Mr. Brad. Check yourself. But hope is not lost, right? Christ, even though with this strong rebuke, one of the strongest rebukes ever given to mankind, very plain, very cutting, there is still hope. Why is there still hope? Because God is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, even in this Laodicea mind frame. Christ is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Revelation 3.18. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18 says this, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou may be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou may see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. This is, this is the wonderful part because this is where we see the love of God. Were we just rebuked? Were we just disciplined? We were. Why did that take place? Because God loves us. Because God loves us. And because God loves us, he doesn't want us to be in a spiritual place that causes destruction. And the only way to get us up out of this Laodicea mind frame, which is so dangerous, is to have a very clear and cutting rebuke. Jesus is not hiding any of the fluff here. Jesus is saying, this is the state you're in. Get out of it. And he gives us the solution. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou may be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame 
of thy nakedness, that the shame of thy sin does not appear. Anoint thy eyes with eye salve. Very important, very important. Let's check this out. Here, Jesus gives us true counsel to get out of the Laodicea mind frame. I'm gonna say that again. Here, Jesus gives us true counsel to get out of the Laodicea mind frame. What does it mean to buy gold tried in the fire? Isaiah 55, one. This is, now hear me out now. You were with me up to this point. You endured through the rebuke. Now here is the healing process. Here is where Jesus says, this is how you are delivered out of a Laodicea mind frame. He gives us everything we need to do to escape this. Isaiah 55, 1. Book of Isaiah 55, 1. Here we go. Book of Isaiah 55, 1. This is what it says. Buy of me gold tried in the fire. Ho, oh, everyone, Isaiah 55, 1. Listen, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come, buy, and eat. Yes, come and buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why does God say, come and buy of me gold tried in the fire, but he doesn't want our money? That's very funny because Isaiah 55, 1 clearly says, God does not want our money. Come and buy milk, the gospel. Come and buy milk and bread and water without money. What, if God doesn't want our money, what does God want? How can I buy this gold if God doesn't want my money? Hear me out now, prosperity pastor. God doesn't want my money. God wants something else. Check this out. Jeremiah 29, 13. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this. Jeremiah 29, 13, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Okay, so we're starting to see something now. God wants us to seek and find him with all of our heart. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. We're seeing something here. What does God want? God wants our heart. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 says this, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Matthew 6, 21. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Matthew 6, 21. For where your heart, or excuse me, for where your treasure is, there is where your heart is. Matthew 6, 21. 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What does God want? God wants our heart. How do we buy this gold from God if he doesn't want money? We buy it with our heart. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. This is what it says. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Oh, Mr. Brad, that's a tithe. That's an offering scripture. No, this is also a scripture about buying gold from God. When we give to God with our heart, do it cheerfully and not grudgingly. 
when we go and buy gold from God, we have to give God our heart. We should do it cheerfully and not grudgingly because God doesn't want our money. God wants our heart. We don't buy gold with money because God doesn't want our money. God wants our heart. The price we pay for receiving this gold is forsaking all and giving God our heart completely. The price we pay for this gold is not money. It's by giving God our heart and forsaking the whole world. What is the gold? What is the gold? 1 Peter 1, 7. What is the gold? First Peter chapter one verse seven. First Peter chapter one verse seven. Excuse me, I'm in Second Peter. First Peter chapter one verse seven. First Peter one seven that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ Jesus. What is the gold? The gold is our faith. How is that gold tried? It's tried in fire. Very important. Very important. Job 23.10. Job chapter 23 verse 10. The gold is our faith, and it's tried in fire. Job 23, verse 10 says this, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Right? So this gold, this is our faith, and we are to be tried in the fire. And then Job clearly says that we are going to be tried and come forth as gold. Why? Why are we tried? Why are we tried? Jeremiah 11, 4. Jeremiah 11, 4. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 4 says this. Why are we tried? Why is our faith tried? Why is our faith con considered like gold? Why are we tried? Jeremiah 11, 4 which I command your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you. So shall ye be my people and I will be your God. God allows us to go through the furnace, the iron furnace, the gold furnace, to try us to see if we will obey him. And as we obey him, our faith is established and established and established. And our faith grows and it develops into gold. This is the gold of God. This is something that's precious to God, our faith. 1 Peter 4, 12. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. And we're going to talk about this gold, but I just want to point this out real quick. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says this. Think not it a strange thing concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers in Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Right? We have to go, we have to give Christ our heart. This is buying the gold. That gold is faith. Right? When we go to Christ with our whole heart, that faith that is developed, which is tried in the furnace, the fires of affliction, develops into something that Christ considers very precious. And the Bible says not to consider it a strange thing when we go through this process. Right, This process is very specific for a reason. Because when you are a goldsmith and you are purifying gold, that's a process. The gold just doesn't go into the crucible one time, right? The goldsmith takes the gold ore, puts it in the crucible, heats the fire up, 
all the dross, all the impurities are taken out. The, the, the goldsmith takes the, the gold out and inspects it. If he sees impurities in the gold, he continues to put it in the crucible, put it in the fiery trials. And then more impurities are taken out. And this process happens over and over, over and over, until something very specific happens. Because when all the impurities are removed from the gold, the goldsmith is able to see his reflection in the gold. So too, it's the same exact process with Christ and us. As our faith is put into the fiery trial, the crucible, impurities are taken out. And this process happens over and over and over again until the master, Jesus Christ, can see his reflection in us. And when he can see his reflection in us, then the trials are over. And this is very important for us to go to God and buy gold from him because it's only he who can develop within us a Christ-like character. It's only he who can develop within us a faith that reflects the faith of Christ. Very important that we need the faith of Christ. Revelation 14, 12. Revelation 14, 12. Revelation chapter 14, 12 says this. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This, this is part of the three angels' message. Laodicea rejects the three angels' message. We, we clearly saw that. We clearly saw it. Laodicea rejects the three angels' message. And if I'm rejecting the three angels' message, I'm rejecting the faith of Jesus. This is why Jesus says, come to me and get gold from me. Come to me and get my faith, right? What was the faith of Jesus? Very important to understand. What was the faith of Jesus? Luke twenty two forty two. Luke twenty two forty two. Luke twenty two forty two. Jesus, Garden of Gethsemane, facing the cross, is going through the torment that he goes through. Begins to drop sweat, uh, droplets of blood. The capillaries in his skin burst. He is in a, 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 some of the most extreme tension a human can go through. And Jesus says this, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. The faith of Jesus was that he completely relied on the Father to help him overcome everything, including going through the sacrifice of the cross he submitted his own will to God the Father. This was the faith of Jesus, that he submitted his own will to God the Father and that he was willing to allow God the Father to strengthen him through any process, including the cross, so that he would do the will of God. This is the same faith we need to have. We need to submit our own wills to God and we need to trust God to strengthen us through every temptation, through every trial, and so much so that we would rather die than sin against God. This is the faith of Jesus. This is that gold. This is that gold. And we need this. We desperately need this. Without this, we will continually stay in a Laodicea mind frame. James 2.5. James chapter 2, verse 5 says this. James 2, 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? People who realize that they're spiritually bankrupt and they have nothing to offer will go to Jesus and receive from him the faith of Christ. People who realize that they're spiritually bankrupt will be completely reliant on Jesus for everything. This is very important to understand that the poor of the world, the people who realize they're spiritually bankrupt, 
are rich in faith. Why are they rich in faith? Because they have the faith of Jesus, who Jesus' faith is the greatest of all faith. Jesus' faith could safely see through the cross and through all that torment and torture and still be happy with obedience to God the Father, regardless of what he went through. He trusted in God the Father so much that he was willing to go through anything to be obedient and faithful to him. This is where the true riches are. This is where the true riches are. And those people who realize that they're spiritually bankrupt, they will put their full trust, faith, and reliance in Jesus. And when our faith is tried and trust, and when we trust God, right, our faith is tried. And when we trust God, we are strengthened to overcome anything. Doesn't matter what it is, because all things are possible in Christ who strengthens us. And as we develop this faith of Christ, we are then overcoming, overcoming, overcoming. And we are purified. And then that faith that we have is um, gold. That as we're purified through this process, the faith that we have is, is purified and it becomes as gold. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. We are winding down now. We're winding down. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18 says this. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest may be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness shall not be seen. Revelation 19, 8. Revelation 19, 8. Revelation 19, 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So here we see this garment, this linen, this clothing that the saints have. This is the righteousness of the saints. Isaiah 61, 10. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, and a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and a bride ordaineth herself with jewels. So this is the garments of salvation. Christ says, I counsel you to buy of me white linen so that the shame of your nakedness be not exposed. Christ is challenging us, accept my salvation. That rejection of the gospel earlier is now here offered again. And he's saying, accept my robe of righteousness. And that the, the shame of your nakedness, which is the shame of sin, that it be not exposed. So here, Christ is offering us to give us his faith. Here, Christ is offering to give us his righteousness. Very important. That Galatians 3.27 says, put on Jesus. Put on Christ's righteousness. Very important. And then Revelation 3.18. I don't want to paraphrase it, so... Here we go. Revelation 3.18 says this. Revelation 3.18 says, And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. What does it mean to be anointed? What does it mean to have the anointing? So let's check this out. 1 John 2.27 What is the anointing? 1 John 2.27, what is the anointing? 1 John 2.27, but the anointing, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So, what is the anointing? Well, it says that the anointing teaches us. So first thing we're going to do is establish the fact that this anointing 
teaches us. Check this out. John 14, 26. John chapter 14, 26. John 14, 26 says this, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things into your remembrance. The anointing was the teacher. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. Very important to understand that this anointing of Isab is the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to come into our lives so that we can see spiritually properly. Right? The Holy Spirit is the one that is the Isab. The Holy Spirit is the one that causes us to see. The anointing is the teacher. The teacher is the Holy Spirit. How do I receive the Holy Spirit? How do I receive the Holy Spirit? Acts 5.32. Acts 5.32. How do I receive the Holy Spirit? Acts chapter 5, verse 32. Acts 5.32 says this, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. How do I receive the Holy Spirit? How do I receive the teacher? How do I receive the guide of all truth? How do I receive the anointing? Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. We receive the Holy Spirit when we are walking in alignment with obedience to God. Very important. Very important because what happens when we are not walking in alignment with uh, obedience to God. The Bible warns us, Ephesians 4.30, what happens when I'm not walking in obedience to God? Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Check this out. We receive the Holy Spirit by being obedient, Acts 5.32. We can grieve the Holy Spirit and he will go away by our disobedience. Very important that this anointing with ISAP, which Revelation 3.18 says, Jesus says, we need this anointing with ISAP. This will cause us to see spiritually. This anointing is the teaching. This teaching is the Holy Spirit guide into all truth. And we got to be very careful that the Holy Spirit remains with us through obedience. Because when we walk in disobedience, we can grieve the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit can go. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Check this part out now. Check this part out now. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 12 to 13 says this. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches Comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Very, under, very important to understand. But the Spirit, which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us. What are the things freely given to us? It's under, very important to understand. The Holy Spirit teaches us all things that are freely given to us. What is freely given to us? Deuteronomy 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. What is freely given to us? Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this. The secret things which belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. 
Second, First Corinthians chapter two, verse uh, twelve and thirteen says that the Holy Spirit teaches us all things that are revealed to us. Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine says that all those things that are revealed to us and our children that we may do the words of the law. What was given to human beings and what is revealed to us is the Holy Scriptures. The whole Bible, Deuteronomy 29, 29, is describing the whole Bible and the Holy Spirit, which is the guide of truth, teaches us all things that are revealed to us in the Scriptures. And this is very important to understand that we need spiritually to have this I say, have this teaching from the Holy Spirit so it can reveal to us all truth. Because in that rebuke that Jesus gave to the Laodiceans, they were rich and increased with goods and need and didn't need anything. They didn't realize that they were in desperate need of the Holy Spirit to show them and guide them in all truth. This is why Jesus literally says, Come, buy gold from me. Come, get eye salve from me. Come, get clothing from me. This is very important to understand the backdrop of why Jesus gave the rebuke and to understand the solution to the problem. Very, very, very important. So spiritual unto spiritual. That's what Second Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13 said, that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes to teach us all those things that are revealed. Spiritual unto spiritual. Deuteronomy 29 said that that was the word of God. John 6, 63 says that that's the word of God. John 6, 63. John 6, 63 says this. It is the spirit that makes alive. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit they are life. So Jesus, the word of God, he says, the things I speak, they are spirit, they are life. First Corinthians chapter 2, 12 and 13 says, the Holy Spirit teaches us everything that's been revealed to us, spirit unto spirit. Deuteronomy 2, uh, 29, 29 says, the law, the word of God is what has been revealed to us. Jesus said, my word is spirit. Very important to understand that the Holy Spirit is our guide into all truth, into all the scripture. And this is spirit unto spirit. This is spirit. This is life. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes so we can understand. Whereas that rebuke to Laodicea was that you are miserable, blind, poor, and naked. Jesus said, come to me and get the eye sap so you can see. Quick review as we draw to a close. Quick review of the healing process that Jesus offers. This is the healing, we're reviewing the healing process that Jesus offers now. The, this is the counsel of the true witness for the healing of Laodicea, right? Jesus warns us to buy gold from him, right? Jesus says, give God your heart and he will develop your faith. Then you are rich when you have the faith of Jesus. It, clearly it said, buy gold from God, right? And when we give God our heart, he will develop in us faith. And then we are rich when we have the faith of Jesus. Jesus counsels us to put on the garments of salvation. The garments of salvation is the righteousness of Christ. This is the receiving the forgiveness of sin. The righteousness of Christ, the receiving of the forgiveness of sin, this is what we put on as white raiment, as white linen. Jesus counsels us to have our eyes anointed with eye salve. And this is becoming obedient to God, receiving the Holy Spirit, which will then give us spiritual eyesight, a spiritual understanding, and spiritual discernment. Revelation 3.19 then proceeds to say, Revelation 3.19 proceeds to say, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Christ is saying to us now, you just went through an extremely hard message. 
and you endured to the end. You have made it up to this point and you are now here. And he reminds us of his love. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. As many as I love, I correct and discipline. Be zealous, therefore. Continue in your effort with passion. And what does he say? Repent. Turn from your sin and be converted. That's what repentance is. It's turning away from sin and being converted in the sense that you don't ever want to do that again. This is the warning of the Laodicea. That, that in this harsh rebuke is the love of God, is the correction of God. Hebrews chapter 12, 6 and 7. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Hebrews 12, 6 and 7. For whom the Lord loves, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and whips every son, every son who he receives. If ye endure the discipline, if ye endure the whipping, if ye endure the chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father does not discipline? Right? And then it goes on to say, but if you are without discipline, then you are not partakers. You are bastards and not sons. So as we go through this Laodicea rebuke, which is um, the strongest rebuke that the Bible can give to an individual Christian, an individual nation, it's extremely hard to have Christ himself reveal the spiritual wretchedness that we are in. He then gives us a counsel on how to change that. And he says to us, I'm doing this because I love you. That's what he's literally, he's saying, I'm doing this because I love you. Proverbs 13, 24. Proverbs 13, 24. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod hates his son, but he that loves him disciplines him much. Right? If God didn't discipline us, he wouldn't love us because he knows that discipline is going to shape and mold us back into the image of God, back into the image of his son. If he didn't discipline us, if he didn't warn us, if he didn't rebuke us, we would stay in our lukewarm situation and we would be lost and deceived and we would go into the lake of fire. Because God loves us, he disciplines us. Very important, very important for us to e embrace this. Very important to embrace this. Are we embracing the discipline of God? This is something as individuals we need to ask ourselves. Do I embrace the discipline of God? And we should. We should embrace this discipline of God because this is how we grow as individuals. When we embrace the discipline of God, when we embrace the correction, the reproof, the instruction of God, we grow as individuals and we grow into the image of Christ in a fuller and complete sense. And so ask yourself in your alone time, Am I ex, uh, embracing the discipline of God? Revelation 3.20. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Right? This is the message to the Laodicea church, the last generation, the final Christian era. There is not another Christian era after this. Jesus says, behold, I am at the door and knock. When somebody's at the door and knocking, they have arrived. It's in this generation that Christ is going to come back. Do not trick yourself into thinking that I still have um, four more generations. Laodicea is the generation where Christ comes back. We can uh, do study after study, show um, literally, prophetically, typologically that this is the generation where Christ comes back. We need to be ready for this second coming. We need to incorporate the gospel into our life. We need to share the gospel with others. 
we need to acknowledge the fact that Christ is going to judge this world and warn others. Warn others. God is going to judge this world. Get your heart and mind ready, right? And we saw that the Laodicea mind frame was actually a rejection of the three angels' message. Dangerous. Learn what the three angels' message is. It's not bound by a denomination. It's the message of Christ to the end time church because he loves us. He wants us to walk with him in uh, spirit and in truth. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice, I will come unto him and sup with him and he with me. Here we go. John ten twenty seven. John chapter 10, verse 27. This is what Jesus says about those who hear his voice. John 10, 27. This is what Jesus says. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Do you hear Christ knocking at the door of your heart? Do you hear Christ's voice calling unto you, saying, my dear sheep, it's time to follow me. If I was you, if I could warn you, if, 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 if I could tell you that the greatest thing in the universe is to have the knowledge of Christ and to have him forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and then that you could follow him, he, that there is nothing this world can offer that could come close to replacing that. Please accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the hour of judgment is come. Christ is coming back soon. Tomorrow is not promised to anybody. Today is the day of salvation. Receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins and be converted. Jesus is giving us a warning and there is a reward, right? Because Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Revelation 19, 9. What is the sup? What is the dinner? How is Christ going to have dinner with us? Revelation 19, 9. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are true sayings of God. Blessed are they which are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus wants us to participate in this marriage supper of the Lamb. Behold, he stands at the door and knock. Do you hear his voice? He would like to have dinner with you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Accept him. Repent from sin. The hour of judgment has come. Accept the three angels' message, which shapes and molds us into worshiping in spirit and in truth. And this is what Jesus continues to go on to say. For those of you who have endured this rebuke, for those of you who have gone through this process of allowing Christ to character change you, this is the reward that Christ promises Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcomes, to him that overcomes the Laodicea mind frame, I will grant him to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Christ says, here is the rebuke. Here is your spiritual state. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Then he goes on to say, here is the solution to the problem. And he says, I stand at the door and knock. I'm coming. And he says, if you overcome, if you have this Laodicea mind frame, if you allow me to shape and ch uh, change your character, if you overcome this Laodicea mind frame, I will allow you to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. 
This is the seat of deity. This is the seat of God. This is where God governs and rules existence. And Jesus says, if you overcome this Laodicea mind frame, I will grant you to sit with me in seat of deity. This is beyond the greatest privilege for the greatest rebuke. We just seen the greatest rebuke in the Bible. And if we endure, if we allow the, the, the character change to take place, we will then be granted the greatest privilege in the universe to sit on the throne with deity. This is why Satan rebelled. This is what Satan coveted in his heart. The sitting on the throne with God as deity. This is why Satan tried to overthrow Satan so he could sit on that throne. And Satan knows that if we overcome the Laodicea mind frame, Jesus will give us the desire which Satan had. And this is why Satan seeks to destroy us so much because he knows that us little tiny, weak little humans, if we overcome, will be granted the privilege that was never given to him because he could never be trusted with it. And so was there a great and strong and mighty rebuke? There was. Start, you better start preaching that gospel. You better start sharing that judgment hour has come. You better start incorporating that three angels message into your life. If not, you remain Laodicean. If you refuse to preach the gospel, if you refuse to share that the hour of judgment has come, if you refuse to incorporate the three angels message, which causes us to worship in spirit and in truth, which prevents a lukewarm mind frame, if you refuse all that, you will remain in that lukewarm state and you will be rejected by Jesus. If you endure the rebuke, if you embrace it and you allow Christ to shape and change you, there is such a blessing on the other side of that we cannot think or imagine. And as we embrace this love, this discipline, this chastisement, remember that God is only doing this because he loves us. Very important, very important as we summarize and review the Bible study, right? That Jesus himself is testing the final Christian church. That's what he's doing. Jesus himself is testing the final Christian church. He calls them lukewarm. That's what he says. He says, you are lukewarm and I will spew you out. He calls us lukewarm because we don't share the gospel and refuse to share people that the hour of judgment has come. He's correcting us for rejecting the three angels' message. Laodicea believes themselves to be rich physically, spiritually, and they believe that they are superior to others and that they are superior to Jesus. The truth is, is that this final church is wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, they're miserable, they're poor, they're blind, they're naked. Jesus offers the Holy Spirit to us to bring to us repentance, to help us spiritually grow and to bring us back into his image and his likeness and to bring us biblical understanding so that we could walk and worship in spirit and in truth. This is a message. This is a call of spiritual pride to the end time church, spiritual pride, spiritual arrogance, which makes Jesus sick and throw up. It's a hard thing to say, but that's, that, that's the truth. The spiritual pride, the spiritual arrogancy, the rejection of the gospel, the rejection of the hour of the judgment of God, the rejection of the three angels' messes causes Jesus to get sick and throw up. And for as bad as we are, that was a strong rebuke, for as bad as we are, we can see God's love and we can see God's patience in the entire rebuke. It's true. We can see God's love and patience through the entire rebuke. And as he's rebuking us, he bids us to have dinner with him. He says, here's the rebuke. But remember, I want to have dinner with you and I have a mighty reward for you. And Jesus stands at the door of our heart and knocks. Will we invite him in? Will we invite Jesus in and will we sup with him? Or are we going to remain proud and arrogant? Are we going to see Jesus knocking at the door of our heart 
and say, I'm not going to let him in? Is our pride going to receive this rebuke? Will our pride prevent us from seeing, uh, receiving this rebuke? Will the pride, the spiritual pride in our hearts and minds prevent this rebuke from correcting us? Is the arrogance of the Laodicea mind frame blinding us from seeing God's love? Is the arrogance of the Laodicea mind frame blinding us from seeing the love of God and the discipline of God are actually the same thing? The love of God, the discipline of God are the same thing. Is the arrogancy of Laodicea preventing us from seeing that? Are you ready for the I salve? Are you ready to receive the Holy Spirit through obedience so that the Holy Spirit can bring you into a biblical understanding so you can worship in spirit and in truth? Are you ready to receive the garments of salvation? Are you ready to have your sins forgiven and put on the mind of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, the life of Christ, which we wear like a robe? Are you ready for the second coming because Jesus is at the door knocking? Are you ready to let go of this Laodicea mind frame? Because after Laodicea, there is no second chances. After Laodicea, Christ comes back, the earth is reaped, and those who have gone into their reward go into their reward, and those will go who have not will go into um, the lake of fire. So this is the straight testimony to the Laodicea church. This is the, the rebuke to Christ's end time church. And we need to incorporate it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's time to get our lives right with Christ. Christ gave us the strong rebuke, but he also gave us the solution to the problem. And he given us all the tools we need to make the correction. And as long as we submit to Christ, he will do the, be the one making the correction. So, the straight testimony to the Laodicea. Stop being lukewarm, because I don't want to spew you out of my mouth. Come be with me in my kingdom forever, and sit with me on my throne. This is the Bible study for today. Uh, I love you very much. Uh, let's keep each other in prayer, and uh, let's do the will of God, submitting moment by moment, day by day. I appreciate you, the time that you give us for Bible study. I know that they run long sometimes. I'm not apologizing for them to run long. What I'm saying is I appreciate your endurance to the end. And um, let's get ready for the second coming. Let's stop being Laodicea, and let's let the Holy Spirit shape and change us into the image of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings you give and rebuke. Lord, it's not fun to get a spanking, but we thank you that you love us enough to do it so that we do not fall into destruction. So Heavenly Father, as we studied the straight testimony to the Laodicea, the last church before Christ comes, we ask that you would forgive us for developing spiritual pride, spiritual arrogancy, for rejecting the gospel and for rejecting the judgment which is the three angels' message. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to recommit our lives afresh to you, brand new right now. And Lord, that you would cleanse and purge us from all unrighteousness and that you would lead us down the road of repentance and conversion. Lord, help us not just to see this message, help us to incorporate it. Help us to share it with others and help us to do your will. Lord, we don't know what the, the end time uh, new world order has in store, so we just ask by your grace and mercy, to hold back the winds of strife so that we can properly be shaped and molded and sealed with the seal of God. Lord, thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Thank you so much for your long patience, long suffering. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that in this holy Sabbath day, that we would walk very closely to your side, that we would do your will, and that we would enjoy this holy Sabbath day. So thank you for the privilege of forgiveness of sin. Thank you for the Bible and thank you for the Holy Spirit. And Lord, would you please make a way for another Bible study? And would you please give us another message? We glorify you, we magnify you, and we say hallelujah because you are the one true righteous God. Thank you, Lord. In, our, in, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bye, everybody. I love you.